Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, John, for inviting me to take part in this great event. Thank you, Roger, for the introduction, and thank you, Paul, for your paper. I have 10 minutes to comment on it. I haven't received the full paper in advance, but we did exchange quite a few emails during the week, so I had a, an idea about what Paul was going to speak. Uh, so mine was also pre-prepared, but I, will, uh, I, I think it works really well. Uh, my first academic post after 10 years of legal practice during which I managed just to also complete a PhD on social and economic human rights was, a research, was as research assistant to Paul Hunt in his then capacity of UN Rapporteur on the Right to Health. Although it was just a brief period of seven months and Paul was rather busy trying to stop the American government from breaching the right to health of detainees in Guantanamo Bay, I remember that time fondly as the beginning of my now 10 years old interest in researching the right to health. I also remember vividly when Paul asked me what, in my view, should be the focus of his next report for the UN General Assembly in the capacity of UN Special Rapporteur. My answer was that it should be a discussion of the concept of maximum available resources which qualifies states' duties to guarantee social and economic rights in the International Covenant, Article 2.1. Octavio is still waiting for that one, I'm afraid. Yeah. My view then, and it's still my view now, is that this is an intractable but crucial task if social rights in general and the right to health in particular are to have teeth. It also fits perfectly with the topic of this conference on human rights and development and relates to the question Paul posed about the reasons why the right to health, but also other social and economic rights, seem to have such a low profile or seem to lack teeth. Well, by having teeth, I mean being capable of providing a reasonably clear standard against which governments can be measured and criticized, which I take to be one of the main functions of the international human rights system. We can call this accountability, uh, as Paul has mentioned a lot in his talk. But let me haste to add a couple of clarifications here to avoid misunderstandings about my position. I do not think that judicial enforcement, often called justiciability, is an essential part of accountability, nor that it is the ideal or the strongest form of accountability. And I think we agree on that, as I just heard. Despite my past as a litigating lawyer for almost 10 years, or perhaps because of this, I think that justiciability is only one among many potential forms of accountability and that its strength may vary significantly according to context. In some cases, as I try to show in some of my writings on the judicialization of the right to health in Brazil, justiciability might actually have negative consequences in the protection of rights. So my point here does not presuppose any particular form of accountability. What it does insist on is that human rights standards possess a reasonable degree of clarity so as some form of accountability, whatever it is, can be meaningfully exercised. Naming and shaming, diplomatic pressure, UN resolutions and reports, and also even adjudication when appropriate. Now, I must haste to add another important clarification to avoid another potential misunderstanding. I do not think either that lack of clarity, that is, indeterminacy or vagueness, is an exclusive attribute of social and economic rights. Civil and political rights can be, and often are, also subject to indeterminacy. And this applies not only to the positive and costly duties that they also give rise to, but also to the negative ones. To cite a couple of examples, what threshold of severity distinguishes torture, inhuman and degrading treatment, and legitimate punishment? Should all prisoners have the right to vote, independent of the gravity of their crimes? I do believe, though, that the nature of indeterminacy varies according to the right and duties at stake. So indeterminacy on torture, voting rights, health, and education are not all the same. And that this may have an effect on the degree of indeterminacy and the difficulties of overcoming it. 
indeterminacy about maximum available resources may be more difficult to overcome, more on this later, than indeterminacy about torture, for instance. But my argument does not rest on what turns out to be the answer to this empirical question. Any right, be it civil, political, social, and economical, will suffer from lack of teeth, that is, from an accountability deficit, to the extent of the indeterminacy of its content. Now, having made these clarifications, I would like now to go back to the maximum available resources quandary. To be able to hold a state accountable for not respecting the right to health or any other social, civil, or political rights corresponding positive duties, we need to know if the state is using its maximum available resources. But how can we know that? If, it's in, if it is impossible to know with a reasonable degree of certainty, then we must resign ourselves, or at least those who support social rights, like us, that they are helplessly indeterminate and, as a consequence, lacking in an important element we tend to associate with the idea of rights, accountability. Whether they can still be called rights or real rights, genuine rights, from the perspective of conceptual truth is, in my view, not the most important matter. The most important matter is that acute indeterminacy faithfully affects the ability of a right to fulfill its paramount function, that is, to enable some form of accountability against states who fail to implement them. Note that the problem here Note that the problem here is not the lack of effectiveness of enforcement mechanisms, another general problem affecting both international and domestic law in general. Poe has referred to that as systemic weakness of the international system. I think we'll hear more about that from Eric Posner at the end of the day, perhaps. The problem here is deeper. Indeterminacy prevents us from knowing what ought to be enforced in the first place. Right to health supporters must therefore give priority to the solution of what we could call the indeterminacy problem. And this involves tackling the intractable yet crucial question of what maximum available resources mean. This question is not, of course, a purely empirical question of how much resources exist in the world or within countries. It is also a normative question about how these resources ought to be distributed and how much ought to be devoted to the fulfillment of the right to health. The intractability of the problem is readily apparent as it involves answering a set of further complex and controversial questions pertaining to the fields of distributive justice and social policy. To cite just a couple of main ones, what should be the, what should be the geographical scope of our inquiry, global or national? Different countries in the world vary enormously in terms of economic development. Should we look at the available resources within countries or in the world as a whole when discussing available resources for the human and therefore universal right to health? Whatever the answer here, a further set of questions need to be tackled. Again, let me mention just a few for the sake of time. How much resources should be available to states vis-a-vis -vis civil society? That is, how much of the aggregate wealth in existence should a state appropriate through taxation and how much should be left in private hands? Once a certain taxation level is set and the state collects revenue, how much ought to be devoted to health in light of all other revenue dependent duties the state has, both rights corresponding duties like education, housing, security, and non-rights corresponding duties like arts, leisure, sports, etc. Once the health budget is fixed, how much should be devoted to each of the myriad health needs of the population? Once the so-called meso-allocation decisions are taken about which needs should be uh, receive resources, how should the resources devoted to each meso area be distributed among competing needy individuals? So even this overly simplified scenario is sufficient, I think, to scare anyone attempting to risk a substantive answer to the question of what maximum available resources mean. It also explains, in my view, why so many have come to the conclusion that we ought to focus on the fairness of the decision-making procedures for answering those questions 
and not on their substantive outcomes. Norman, Norman Daniels came straight to mind. Yet, I emphasize, if this is all that the right to health is a right to, a right that imposes a duty on states to decide how, how to allocate its available resources in a fair manner, with no reasonable, clear, substantive constraints on how much resources health ought to receive and how these resources should be distributed, then the accountability element of that right is not very strong. Its teeth are not very sharp. Perhaps this is all we can hope for, to paraphrase one of the prominent speakers of the afternoon. Perhaps the right to health and all other social rights or positive duties corresponding to civil and political rights are more like indeterminate goals to be pursued with some degree of priority, a strong social commitment in Amartya Zen's formulation. And as he rightly puts it, this, not, this is not so little. Some of the most developed public health systems in the world were built on such indeterminate goals. I think Fukuda Par referred to some of that in her speech as well. But we may perhaps aim higher, and by that I conclude. And this would be particularly important in countries where such strong social commitments cannot be taken for granted. One potential route, of which we will hear much more later on, is the so-called minimum core approach. I think it goes in the right direction in trying to establish minimum entitlements that can be immediately claimable, that is, that have teeth, but I have not seen yet a clear proposal on how the minimum core can be specified. I also disagree with how it is usually presented as a subset of the full right, as in my view this creates an artificial and implausible distinction between core and non-core rights. So to finish, a more promising way forward in my view would be to strengthen the procedural conditions of a fair allocation of resources with some minimum substantive content grounded on the idea of equity. This would serve as a trump against certain allocative decisions which are clearly inequitable, such as funding highly expensive interventions for non-serious conditions that affect mostly the better off, while not funding extremely cheap health interventions for very serious conditions that affect mostly the poor. The literature on the just distribution of health resources has been developing principles and discussing many concrete examples of such unjustified decisions. They sometimes call it unacceptable trade-offs. We lawyers, and I think we agree on that, need to engage much more with this scholarship in our attempt to specify the content of the right to health. So such decisions, I think, can be plausibly criticized as a breach of the duty to use maximum available resources, so as everyone can enjoy the right to health. Now, this proposal, and I finish, which needs much more elaboration, and I cannot give it here for obvious reasons, provides some teeth, that is, some accountability to the right to health, and could be extended, in my view, to other social rights as well. There will remain many cases, of course, in which no clear answer will be available. But this is in the nature of the right enterprise, be they social and economical, or civil and political. Thank you. Well, thanks very much to our speakers for, um, well, first of all, to Paul for that panoramic view of uh, progress and uh, the plea, I think, to, to keep on pushing, and to uh, Octavio for those, um, well, for, uh, particular proposal uh, there. Um, so, the floor is open for comments and questions. C can I follow Anora's ex example and just, well, we already have, I'm going to go to the right, to the very far back, and then to the gentleman in the red jumper, okay? Thank you very much, uh, Siobhan McInerney from the World Bank. Thank you, Paul. Um, thank you, Octavio. I listened carefully, Paul, to the four explanations, possible explanations you gave for resistance to right to health among government officials. Um, they sounded really familiar to me, and I think you know the question that's coming. Uh, if you were confronted with a development practitioner asking you why human rights, um, what, in your view, after all these years of work in this area, as well as 
on the specific interface of human rights and development, what in your view is the strongest articulation of value added, leaving aside for a moment how controversial it is to be looking for instrumental arguments. So how would you, how would you answer the question of what is the, the value added? Thank you. Another question? Yeah, we'll have the gentleman in the red as well, so just hold that question for a minute while Paul's thinking about the answer. Uh, thank you for your talks. Um, I had a question for uh, Professor Hunt. Uh, given what you said, do you think that the most effective way to um, further the right to health is to combat uh, neoclassic economic theories? Could you repeat that for me, please? Do you, do you think that uh, the best way to further the right to health in the world is to fight against neoliberal economic theories? Uh, the second question first, the answer is yes. Uh, I, I, think, I think contemporary understandings of economic neoliberalism have to be contested. And uh, I, I think we now have sufficient evidence, as I indicated earlier, we have sufficient evidence um, that um, economic neoliberalism uh, as, uh, that has prevailed in the last three decades or so uh, has um, immiserized, impoverished um, significant numbers of vulnerable communities and widened inequalities and deepened poverty in some quarters, not in all, in some quarters. And, and uh, I, my view at this point, my mind remains open, is that, um, uh, that we, we need a different economic model. Um, and uh, if we remain with um, the present understanding of economic neoliberalism, we are not going to get the enjoyment of economic social cultural rights for all. Have I answered your question? I'd like to know what your view is. Can I go to Siobhan's question? Um, yeah, I mean, thanks. Thanks for nothing, Siobhan. Such a difficult question. <laughs> um, no, seriously, thank you for the question. It's a really important one. And after all these years, I should have a crisp answer to it. Um, the, the, the way, I, I don't think it's crisp, but my response to it in no particular order is that um, the law requires human rights to be taken into account. So as a lawyer, it's a legal requirement. A, a legal policy, a, a policy has to conform to environmental standards, it has to inform, it has to conform to, um, in local government, to, to planning standards, it has to uh, conform to ta tax requirements. A policy has to conform to human rights standards. It's, it's, e even if the mechanisms of accountability at the international level and the international level international level and national level are weak, it's still the law. And it doesn't cease to be the law because accountability mechanisms are feeble. So the lawyer's answer is, it's the law. You've got to comply with it. The second, the second point would be that I think there's increasing evidence, but still too little, that taking on a human rights-based approach um, furthers uh, human flourishing. In the context of the right to health, that taking on a human rights-based approach reduces human suffering. That it has positive health gains for individuals, communities, and populations. There's now some evidence to that. So if you wish to be a, uh, if you are a developmental, uh, a, a, a professional working in development and you want to know how to enhance development, you look to the evidence and part of the evidence suggests integrate human rights. Now I accept the evidence is still um, much thinner than I would wish. I, I don't think that is because um, there, isn't, there are not positive gains arising from a human rights-based approach to development. I think that part of the reason why we have so little evidence is that we haven't been asking those questions. We, we the human rights community, has been looking, mainly resting upon normative arguments. 
And I think that we need the norm normative arguments, but we also need the evidential arguments if we're interested in multidisciplinary collaboration. Now, this is relatively new because for years, lawyers had a stranglehold, frankly, on human rights. But now, operationalization of economic, social, cultural rights means we have to have on board health professionals, economists, and so forth and so on. And if we're going to engage with those other disciplines, we have to have evidence that will help to persuade them. So the second not uncrisp, the second uncrisp answer to your question is that there is now some incipient evidence of, um, of uh, impact that taking on a human rights-based approach um, contributes to human flush flourishing. The third, the third thing is not quite the same as the first two, but there's a, there's a moral requirement to engage in human rights. So putting aside law, putting aside evidential impact, there's, there's a, an ethical imperative which finds expression in human rights law to engage in a human rights-based approach. So, Shaborn, it's a pleasure to see you here again. And, um, and that, that is, a, that is a, a, a not terribly satisfactory answer to your very pertinent question. Down here, just halfway down, and then across. Hi, uh, thanks. Uh, I'm Adam Entz, and I'm coming from the University of St. Andrews. I was intrigued by this uh, comment you made about the need to combine normative reasoning with empirical uh, evidence. So I just wanted to ask you to elaborate on that a little bit. So you talked about big data. I'm not sure what that is, uh, but I was curious uh, what you, what's in the back of your mind when you, when you use the example. Are you thinking about randomized control trials here? that would measure the effectiveness of different health-based interventions? Are we supposed to use this data to think about what it's possible for states to do, what it's reasonable to expect, to expect states to do, or what the most effective interventions would be? I just wanted to sort of get an example in my mind so that I could you know, use that to sort of think a little bit more about what you're suggesting. Do you want to get the other questions? One? Yeah, we'll have the other question as well, if we may. <laughs> well, big, big data could consume a lot of time, but we'll just have this question as well, if we may, yeah. Okay, my, my question is for Octavio, so should I uh, ask it or, yes? Okay, so I, I was very interested in your discussion of maximum available resources, which I've, I've puzzled about also. And um, it seems to me that, you know, as you mentioned, there's a certain amount of wealth in a country and, and a certain portion of it the government will be able to extract in order to spend in whatever way. And I think the, the, uh, the instinct of, let's say, these policy analysts who don't pay much attention to human rights would be the government should just spend this money in whatever way produces the maximum amount of well-being for people. So, and we look at the marginal dollar, so the marginal dollar, maybe it should be spent on health, but maybe it should be spent on public art, or for cleaning up litter, or for repairing street signs. You know, there, there are a whole number of things that the government might optimally do with that money. And um, the thing about that is that it's not clear to me that you need the, the once you're thinking in that way, that you need a right uh, to health anymore. You, you just tell governments, encourage governments to spend the money in, in the way that will maximize the well-being of people, which of course health is a, an important part of their well-being. But it, it seems to me once you take that idea of resources seriously, uh, what's, what is left of, of, of the right to health? And I, what you hinted at was that there's some more minimal uh, notion of health that's left over, but, but it, it would be great if you would expand on that. Okay, I'll go first. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I, I think we have to distinguish in the much more elaborated version of this, I distinguish between several levels of resource allocation. The first one you mentioned, how much tax the state can collect from society, I'd call it macro level. And then there are the meso and the micro level, so it goes down and it becomes more and more specific. I agree that at the macro level, it's very difficult to establish any criteria. Well, how much should the tax burden in a country be? If it is zero, one of the examples you gave, I think it's clearly incompatible with 
any rights because you will not be able to do anything unless the neoliberal magic has worked so well that everyone is well off. But in normal circumstances, you need a reasonable degree of tax revenue to be able to do things. So, but this is impossible, I think, to determine what is the correct level. But once you've done that, say you've devoted 4% of the GDP to health, which is the case of Brazil where I come from, right? Then within that budget, I think there are some decisions that would go against the right to health. And I gave one example, and it's an example which actually doesn't come from my fanciful dreams, but it, it's a reality in many countries. You invest a lot in some very expensive equipment or drugs that might add a couple of weeks, if that, to the lives of well-off individuals who are already advantaged in terms of health, and 50% of the population lack basic sanitation, right? I think there you could make a strong claim that the right to health is being disrespected. So on the general, when you focus only on well-being, you are thinking about the whole health, education, housing, all the, the policies. But most countries divide their budgets into health, education, uh, housing, and then once that is done, I think there is a degree of control, of accountability that human rights can bring to the meso and micro decisions that will be taken. I hope it's kind of an explanation. Um, thanks for your, your question. And um, I'll, I'll make a few remarks, but um, do take a look at the special issue, December 2015, of the Harvard Health and Human Rights Journal, which looks at these tricky issues uh, around uh, evidence of impact of human rights uh, on health. Um, look, this is this is quite a new field, and you know we don't we don't have. I, I don't mean the right to health is a new field. That is too in historical terms. But I mean the the question of evidence of impact of human rights is quite new, and um, much more work needs to be done to clarify issues of of method and. Um, evidence and uh, causation. But to try and answer your question specifically, in one study we, we looked at some countries and we asked two questions. We said, for, uh, the first question was, have human, is there evidence that human rights have explicitly shaped certain, not all, certain health policies? So that's the first question. Is there any evidence that human rights have explicitly shaped certain policies? So that requires us looking at the laws, policies, the wording of, uh, of ministerial statements. It requires you know, looking at implementation programs. Um, it requires digging down quite deeply into, into policies, plans, and uh, programs. And in some cases we found, well, you know, there was reasonable evidence that, that human rights had shaped this stuff. There was a minister saying that he, was, he or she was going to do it. And then when you unpack the implementation plans, there were human rights explicitly, and their concepts were there too. So that's, that was the first question. Have human rights explicitly shaped certain uh, policies? And then there's a... The second question is much harder. Is there any evidence that those explicitly human rights shaped interventions have contributed to health gains? And that's difficult. Um, so you talked about randomized control trials. We, we formed the view that um, the test of causation um, could not be probabilities and randomized control trials. We thought that was inappropriate. But we also thought the lowest standard, which the book's called adequacy, we also thought that level of evidence was inadequate. So we thought the highest level, probabilities, and the lowest level, adequacy, were inappropriate. And instead, we settled for one which the books call uh, plausible levels of evidence, which is defined and described. So using that test, we then looked at these policies, which were explicitly human rights shaped, 
and we looked at what had happened in the country when we looked at the data. <coughs> and it seemed to us that there was, there were, it was possible to make the argument that those human rights shaped interventions had contributed to the health gains. We did not say caused. I don't think it's possible to do that, but to say it had contributed to, along with a lot of other, a lot of other things that were happening in the countries in question. So, all that stuff raises really difficult issues of methodology, of epistemology, of causation, which require much more work. But I think if we're interested in operationalization, that takes us into multidisciplinarity, and that I think takes us into this question of evidence of impact. Okay, down here now. And then, well, we'll just take this one first, and then if we have time, we'll come up to the back over there. Yeah. Thank you. I want to follow up on the questions about um, uh, neoliberalism. Um, Paul, you uh, were very sort of blanket, made a blanket statement about how neoliberalism had kind of led to uh, increasing inequalities and human suffering and, and so forth. But isn't, in a sense, um, you know, do, doesn't one have to look a bit further in, in that um, neoliberalism as a sort of a model of economic um, policy um, has contradictory effects to human well-being in certain areas but not in all. And, and that the health sector, the organization of the health sector is particularly one where there are these trade-offs can exist. I mean, I don't believe that there is a trade-off between economic growth and human rights. But there are certain specific areas where there may be a lot more tension than, than in others. And I, and I isn't because the health sector and the sort of the provision of services, the, uh, the production of uh, pharmaceutical products and all of this, this, the economics of those operations are so relevant for the human rights to health and other rights as well that, um, that the, the, the tension between neoliberalism and human rights is particularly acute in this sector in a way that it might not be in, in others, that neoliberalism may actually be quite positive for human rights in, in other, other domains. Yeah, I'll have to go back to my precise words. Perhaps I wasn't clear, but I, was tr I should have been confining myself to the health. Uh, I, think that, I think that there's an inconsistency between the right to the highest attainable standard of health and as presently practiced, presently prevailing, the economic uh, neoliberal orthodoxy. And I think now there's quite a lot of evidence to support that position. And, um, and uh, hence my, the, my answer to the question from the gentleman wearing the red uh, pullover. Um, may I, Roger, please make a comment, which is partly in response to Octavio's yeah. remarks. Is that okay? Yeah, can I just chat sure. with John about, John, uh, and can, have we got time for one more? Yeah, if, okay, well, and then we'll take the question right at the back there. Then. I'll interrupt me if I go on too long, Roger. I'll try and be brief. Look, the issue of maximum available resources is really difficult. It requires much more intellectual work. Um, I accept that. And I look to Sakiko, and she provides me in her work with some guidance, and Diane Elson, and so forth and so on. And much more needs to be done. You know, Albert Wheel was at a seminar on the right to health not long ago, and he, he used the phrase, I don't ask what the right to health can do to you, ask what you can do for the right to health, right? And I, I was going to use that as the heading for my talk, but then I didn't in the end. But, you know, we need help from developmental economists to work this out. And uh, I don't pretend for one second to have all the answers. I mean, no individual does. So, but can, can, I, can I make this point? Look, when rapporteur, I was invited to go to India to look to the right to health. Can you imagine? India, the right to health in 10,000 words. So I, I was happy to go and I looked at one particular issue, maternal mortality in India. And I chose to look at two states in India. That was still a huge undertaking. 
but myself and colleagues did the best we could with research and talking, many, many people as possible. We went to India, we traveled a lot, and so forth and so on, meeting ministers through to community groups. But one of the things that we found in India was that in the, the government was very proud of a policy it had, which was the training of ANMs, Auxiliary Nurse Midwives. And these were, uh, it was understood that these were there to uh, help uh, women in childbirth, and they were there to ensure that maternal mortality was as low as possible. Okay, great. And there were 130, from memory, there were 130,000 ANMs in India. That was a lot, even for India. But when you looked at the ANMs, they had, 30 years ago, their training included a lot of stuff on, on midwifery. But over the years, they'd been given more and more duties and more and more training, and the midwifery training had got smaller and smaller. And in the end, it struck me and others, I wasn't alone, that actually these 130,000 ANMs did not have the competency to be midwives. It wasn't their fault, it was a matter of their training. So at first sight, it looked fantastic. India's doing a lot to address maternal mortality. You look more closely, and they, they, they'd made a mistake. And in my report, I argued that, that this constituted an inconsistency with, their with the government's international right to health obligations. They didn't argue that there was insufficient money. They'd made a mistake. And the right to health prism applied to the ANMs helped expose that mistake. Now, other prisms could have done, too, but they hadn't. In, in India, another uh, problem was that wh when I asked in the federal level, health is devolved, but when I asked at the federal level, you know, how many technical officers do you have dealing with maternal health? From memory, forgive me if I'm slightly wrong, from memory there were three. Right, three for India. Sorry, this is not credible. And it wasn't that the government was saying we don't have enough money to, to appoint more technical officers. They just had made a mistake. They hadn't got enough technical expertise on maternal mortality at the federal level, which was meant to be monitoring what was happening throughout India. It was ridiculous. But it wasn't because there was a lack of resources. There was a mistake. Now, thirdly, and then I'll, I'll be quiet, Roger. Thirdly, when I asked, well, you know, where, do you have a plan about reducing maternal mortality? And at that time, there wasn't one. And it struck me that those three things constituted violations of the government's obligations, uh, violations of the government's responsibilities and obligations under the international right to health. No plan, in completely insufficient technical officers at the federal level, and the ANMs, no fault of theirs, no longer had the competences to do the job that they were meant to be doing. Well, th thanks, Paul, for that very compelling example. Uh, I think perhaps just this last question we make, the, yeah, the, I don't know whether we've got one or two questions just on the back. I know you said, is it one question that you're sharing or? Yeah. Yeah, okay, go on then. Okay, hi. Uh, me and my friend were year 13 students and my question is for Mr. Hunt. When you were listing the four things that you think is hindering um, the right to health, you mentioned um, a cons consensus approach where everybody agrees. So we agree with you in thinking that that kind of approach can silence the voices of the people that actually need to be heard and the people that actually need the help. So our question to you is, is that do you think that this kind of approach is going to be changed? And if it isn't, do you think that this is like institutionally constructed to stop progress? So that's my question. That's our question to you. Well, Octavio might want to respond to this uh, uh, as well. But um, uh, at the moment, I think it's not settled how to figure out the content and scope of the right to health. I think it's disputed as to what the appropriate mechanisms should be. And in the books, some of them argue it should be a consensus approach. And I was putting a question mark over a consensus approach. So I think we're still f trying to work out what would be a suitable process for determining the, the content of the right to health. And some favor consensualism, I don't. I'm sorry if I've missed your point. We can talk over lunch. Okay? Octavia, do you want to have a go? No. Okay, well, look, thanks very much indeed to Paul and to Octavio for um, food, plenty of food for thought and uh, some brilliant talks. Thanks for your questions, but it is time for lunch, and we will resume earlier this afternoon. <laughs>